So welcome to Brown Bag History for October 30th, 2024. We'll be talking about education in Revelstoke. And, uh, as we begin, we acknowledge that the land around Revelstoke and on the Columbia River and its tributaries is the Sinaiq's homeland and traditional territory. We acknowledge the ties of the Sequipmec, the Okanagan Nation Alliance Silks, and the Tanaha to this land. We acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land sacred to these four nations. We respectfully honor their traditions and culture. So um, the, um, it was a while before there were enough school children in Revelstoke to warrant a school. There was, it was pretty much, you know, it was very much a man's town for quite some time. And then families were settling here. And in, um, 1886, there was a, a committee of three that put together to, that, to arrange for having a school in Revelstoke. And they did a survey that showed that there was a school age population of 13 children between the ages of six and 16 and 10 more under six. So the first school in Revelstoke, in, in Revelstoke and really in all of the West Kootenai opened on January, 1887 in a rented building previously known as the Wide West Saloon. Okay. It was a gambling and drinking uh, uh, saloon. It uh, stood on the riverside of Front Street between Victoria Hotel and the railway bridge, um, closer to the bridge. So it would be um, to the, uh, off of the, off of the photograph here um, in beyond what show is shown on the, in this photograph, but on this side of the, the street, the river side of the street. They didn't, there was no um, accredited teacher in town. So the first teacher at the time was Laura M. McAlpine, who was given a temporary certificate to teach. Uh, she was uh, 17 years old and her father was Dougal Leach McAlpine, who was Revelstoke's first doctor. And uh, she was teaching several of, of her siblings as well. And uh, the McAlpines actually lived on an island uh, across from the end of, of Front Street. The, the island no longer exists because the, the changes in the river after this was part of the Arrow Lakes Reservoir. Uh, but uh, the uh, family said that the reason that they, Mr. Mc, Dr. McAlpine built his uh, home on the island was because he didn't want his children on Right down, right in Farwell and around Front Street, because it was a, it was pretty wild westy town at the time, and he didn't want them sort of being being in those in those kinds of influences. Um, but the the average attendance was uh, ten point three, and the school lasted for one hundred and four days before the end of June, and they had an the honor roll included uh, George Keyes, who was awarded for de deportment, and George James Gavin, who was uh, awarded for punctuality and regularity. And proficiency was given to Florence Muriel McAlpine, the younger sister of the teacher. Uh, the first school trustees were uh, Mr. G.M. Sprout, who was the uh, stipendiary magistrate in town, and Fred Fraser, who was involved in a lot of was a farmer in the Big Eddy, but involved in a lot of things uh, in this area as well, and had 10 children. I don't think any of them were quite old enough to be at school at that time. Um, and then a man named S.W. Lobb on the, as the school trustees. So uh, that school didn't reopen after that, that first uh, term. So it wasn't until... The slides aren't in that scene here. It wasn't until uh, 1889 that uh, they resumed school classes and they were uh, able to, uh, th by that time they had enough, uh, enough uh, students in town to warrant getting in a, a qualified teacher. Uh, so the teacher was a man named James W. Thompson, he you can see in the photograph. And uh, he came here from the, the Chilliwack area. He was uh, a, a qualified teacher. And uh, the schoolhouse was the old Northwest Mounted Police Barracks, which were at the top of Douglas Street Hill. And the, the schoolhouse was also used for church services and was a community hall. So it was a, 
in the general uh, public building. And uh, the, some of the, the children there, now this uh, little boy in the front row, the fifth from the right was, um, was Sam Needham and uh, he, he Sam Needham Sr. There was, actually it was Sam Needham the second because his father was also Sam and then his son was Sam. So, uh, but most people refer to him as Sam Needham Sr. because he was the most senior that, that locals would have would have really remembered. Um, there's other um, children from the local families that were here in the very early days. So um, when I show this to school children, we always talk about uh, how the, the girls are dressed and the fact that they're, the girls are all wearing dresses. And then I tell them that I had to wear a dress when I went to elementary school as well. Uh, they, they think that's pretty bad. <laughs> so, um, that school opened in 1889 with 28 pupils. Uh, nine boys and uh, 19 girls initially. And um, so some of the students, as I mentioned, were the, the Needham's, uh, Thompson's own children, and the Valentine children. And it was a big family of them as well. And uh, um, Mr. Thompson uh, resigned in uh, April of 1890, and uh, he moved with his family to the head of the Earl Lakes and established a community of Thompson's Landing which was later named Beaton. So uh, he's, he's one of the originators of the, the town site of Beaton. Then uh, the next teacher was Miss A.F. Kirkup, who was the sister of the local police constable, Jack Kirkup. Uh, by the end of 1890, there were 44 pupils, 21 boys and 13 girls, but the average attendance was only 18. Uh, the uh, school board was, uh, officially recognized uh, by the Department of Education in Victoria in, in 1890. And uh, they agreed to provide $1,500 to build a new school. Um, so in August 13th, 1890, a public meeting was held to select a site for the new school. And uh, originally they wanted to, uh, to use block three on Front Street, but it was set aside by the superintendent of education due to irregularities. Nobody has specified what the irregularities were, but it could well have had something to do with the, the Farwell town site and ownership issues. Um, so then they chose block 53, uh, which was the 700 block between uh, second and third streets. So it's um, this location, but the school that's on here is not the, the, the original school that we're gonna be talking about. Um, I don't know the exact location of this, the first, uh, school building, but I believe it was probably somewhere in this part of the property. And uh, the contract was awarded uh, to uh, build to that school and for uh, James McDonald and Company for $2,675. And the dimensions were 75 feet by 26 feet with two rooms of equal size designed to accommodate 60 pupils each and had a bell tower 60 feet high with a bell donated by Fred Fraser, who was one of the school uh, superintendent or school uh, trustees. Uh, the uh, first teacher of that school was uh, Lydia Jane Irvine Hume. And um, she, uh, on January 13th, 1891, she led her 27 pupils to the opening of what was the first publicly owned school building in the West Kootenays. Uh, enrollment that year was 38. Uh, 19 boys and 19 girls, but the average attendance was still only 16. Uh, Lydia uh, Irvine left at the end of the school year to marry businessman J. Fred Hume, who was one of the first uh, business owners um, in uh, on Front Street. He had a big general store down there. And they uh, uh, shortly thereafter moved to Nelson. So, and the name Hume is well known in Nelson. The Hume Hotel was uh, started by J. Fred Hume. There's a Hume school that's named after him as well. Um, so this is uh, the school in 1899. Um, in uh, November of 1891, they were concerned about water for the, the, the school and they uh, put in a well costing $300. Uh, 
sunk on the the the, uh, the block where the school was, and they finally found water at 54 feet, but the quality was uh, quite poor. So they uh, would dispense water in barrels from Brewery Creek. There was a note from 1895 said at an exam held by Inspector Burns during his visit of inspection to the Revelstoke Public School, Miss Ruth Valentine obtained the percentage required for admission to high school. She was the first of the school to try it. And of course, Revelstoke didn't have a high school at that time. So uh, she left it uh, for Vancouver to attend uh, high school. And that was the case if, uh, if uh, students wanted to go to high school at that time, they had to leave town. Um, so by the spring of 1896, there were uh, 61 pupils enrolled with an average attendance of 46. There were six grades, allowing the teacher less than one hour per day per individual grade. Uh, the local paper urged the board of trustees to hire an assistant the trustees said that they would do that if parents would assist in enforcing more regular attendance. And the, uh, in 1896, the um, school teacher, Mr. H.A. McTaggart, was earning $70 a month. There's a slight increase over the previous teacher. In uh, 1898, the divisional point at, uh, of the Canadian Pacific Railway at Donald was eliminated and the jobs were moved to Revelstoke, including and a lot of the, the houses were moved here as well and rebuilt here. So it meant that there were there was an influx of new families, and um, the so there was concerns about you know accommodating all these new students. In October of 1899, they added a new wing to the original building, and three more teachers were hired. Um, and by that time, the enrollment was over 200. As you can see in this photograph, there's uh, 200 uh, students and five teachers. And um, so overcrowding was becoming a serious problem. They were using uh, rented classroom space and um, little additional buildings um, on the property. And uh, they uh, built, an, built an addition onto it. Uh, but at that time, they had uh, three divisions uh, housed in the hallway, and all available space was overcrowded, and dozens of students were ready to go into a high school that was non-existent. So it was uh, definitely becoming an, an issue. In uh, January of 1902, the uh, trustees applied to the provincial government for $10,000 for a new school, school building. And uh, the local bylaw was submitted to taxpayers for an additional $8,000 to build an eight room school. So in uh, July of uh, 1902, the contract was put out for the construction of the school. It was awarded to Smith Brothers Construction of Grand Forks with a tender of $13,987. And uh, J.B. Henderson of Grand Forks was the architect. So it was built on block 53, which later on became the playing field for Mountain View School. And um, it was named Central School and opened in January, 1903 under the new principal, Albert Edgar Miller and the staff of uh, five teachers. Uh, the newspaper uh, talked about the opening. He said that it said, uh, the heating and sanitary arrangements leave nothing to be desired. The sanitary arrangements are as vastly superior to what we had before as day as tonight. By that, they mean toilets, mm -hmm. washrooms. Um, Miss Grant, the primary teacher, was uh, in charge of those who have just started on their scholastic career. In this room, there is evidence of forethought on the part of somebody, and that is that the blackboards are within reach of the smallest ones. Um, and the old school building was moved to the corner of Mackenzie Avenue and 2nd Street, where it became the first city hall building. Uh, before the end of the term, um, Miss Eva Hobbs was hired. Um, she um, was um, the one that uh, that Eva Lake is named after. She was a mountaineer. She was involved with the uh, uh, Alpine, one of the charter members of the Alpine Club of Canada. And uh, when they were out on a, a hike one day with some other other people, um, she was a little bit disgusted about how slow some of the other women were going and getting 
the men to hold their hands over the rough bit. So she forged on ahead and saw this. Uh, they went beyond Miller Lake, which is already named, and um, said she saw another lake and went back to tell everybody, and they didn't believe her. So they walked in together, and uh, there was Eva, this other lake, and they said, well, it should be named after you. So that's how Eva Lake got it got its name and then miller lake i'll talk about i'll talk about miller in just a just a moment uh, but enrollment at the end of 1903 was uh, 288 and uh, and growing so, uh, albert edgar miller was uh, born in ontario in 1872 uh, came to vancouver in 1899 and completed his teacher training and uh, th so he came to revelstoke in 1902 to take charge of central school and then in 1908, he was appointed inspector of schools for the Revelstoke district and continued in that position until uh, 1939. Um, he was uh, one of the first people that explored, uh, local people that was exploring Mount Revelstoke and Miller Lake is named after him. Although it was said that he was guided into Miller Lake by a man named uh, Dan McIntosh. So it could, could potentially have been McIntosh Lake, but, but it is Miller Lake. Um, he was uh, Rebel Stokes' good citizen in 1946 and uh, donated 400 books from his personal library to the Rebel Stoke Public Library before they moved to Victoria. He also donated two parcels of land for parkland, Birchcliff Park, uh, which is uh, at Begbie Falls, and so is now owned by the, the um, CSRD, and uh, part of Centennial Park, which he called K Kiwana Park. So he was definitely a significant person in the education history here. Uh, eventually, the uh, roof on Central School was uh, made was flattened. They took off the the bell tower, and uh, then Central School burned down in uh, early June 1959. So that uh, a transient uh, broke into the building and lit a fire for warmth, and it it destroyed uh, quite a bit of the building, and they they had to tear it down. Um, my husband Ken said that he was staying with his cousin just a block away from it, and they heard all this commotion and went out and watched uh, watched the school burn down. So it was uh, quite a sad day for the community. Um, so then, Central uh, Selkirk School was the next uh, uh, elementary school to be built. And it caused quite a bit of controversy. The, they were trying to decide where to build it. And um, they, one of the possible sites was Block 50 on 6th Street West because the city already owned that property. And, uh, but there were some amongst the school board who thought that the second school should be built either on the same block as the um, as Central School or the block across the street, which is now where Moberly Manor is. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, some of the school board said that it made sense to have this, the, the schools in a, both in a central location. Uh, then you'd only need one principal. Uh, you know, you could, they could manage things better. Um, and one of the big drawbacks for the location on 6th Street was that it was on the outskirts of town. So in, in uh, 1909, when they were having these discussions, there wasn't a heck of a lot around, around the, there at the time. Uh, the, the not, still not too much building around that area. And it was sort of considered just on, on the boundary of, of what, was, what was the uh, city limits at the time. Um, so there was, there was a lot of discussion. Um, I've done a whole talk just on the whole a uh, couple around where to build uh, Selkirk School. But uh, after a lot of contention and resignations from both the school board and the city council over the issue, they finally uh, decided on the 6th Street site and they had a local uh, bylaw uh, to uh, a local plebiscite about it and uh, it, people were in favor. Although they had an initial bylaw in the, earlier and it, it failed. So, but finally with enough discussion and convincing people that this was the best site in terms of you know, uh, economics um, and location, they finally agreed to it. 
So uh, the eight room school was built on 6th Street East and uh, opened in January of 1911. It was designed by a Revelstoke architect, William King, and built by the firm of uh, Foot and Predellini, who uh, later built uh, Revelstoke Courthouse and what's now the Taco Club and the Paddleboard SUB, SUP. Uh, and the, um, yeah, Pink Castle, or what was known as Pink Castle, it's no longer pink, but that was the, the, family, the family home. Um, they also built what was uh, Manning's restaurant as well. So they, they were um, well-known builders in town. Um, they had a contest to name the school, and the winner was um, uh, was uh, Lily Daniels with the name Strathcona, and she won five dollars for for naming the school. But the uh, uh, province was uh, asking the school board to change the name because there was already a well-known Strathcona school in Vancouver, and they didn't want to. Although I'm pretty sure there's a lot of duplication of school names but they, they really fought over Strathcona and the school board really tried to push back on that, but eventually they, they gave in and changed the name to Selkirk. So everybody knows it now as Selkirk School. It was Selkirk from within the first year. And um, in, um, so there were initially uh, 177 children from grades one to four attending Selkirk and 278 uh, in grades one to eight at Central School. And um, within uh, two years, children from grade one to eight were attending Selkirk as well as Central. And the dividing line was Mackenzie Avenue. So if you lived on the west side of Mackenzie, you went to Central, and if you lived on the east side of Mackenzie, you went to uh, to Selkirk. Um, so the there ended up being a, quite a high population of Italian students going to Selkirk School because most of the Italian population lived sort of in the the, the, the um, far you know on the east side of mostly from about Robson and south like into the south side area. Uh, that whole area was known at one time as Little Italy, so there was always a high population of Italian students in in Selkirk School. Uh, this was uh, the uh, grade seven class in 1920. And uh, the girl in the front row on the right is uh, Ruby Rutherford, who became Ruby Knobs. It was my boss here at the museum for many years. Um, one of the boys in there, I can't identify him right here, but there's uh, Peter Grower, who became a high school teacher in Revelstoke. <laughs> uh, this is uh, some of the teachers around 1953. Uh, in the back, we have uh, Wendy Smythe, Paul Salva, Bud Stovall, and Harold Stringer. And in the front is uh, Joan Seeger, Toots Dean, and I haven't been able to find Toots' real name, um, Helen Hammond, uh, Dorothy Lindsay, and Florence Carton. Uh, most of them are really well-known uh, local school teachers. Uh, certainly amongst the most well-known was uh, Helen Hammond, she taught generations of uh, Revel, Revelstoke students. Yeah, yeah, grade one and then later kindergarten. So th this is her grade one class in 1962. And I know we do have some of the, uh, the names for some of the children in that picture. Uh, so uh, Selkirk School closed on June 26, 1980. Uh, there was definitely a lot of public outcry over that, uh, trying to people trying to save the the school, but the uh, school board was saying it was in really poor condition and uh, they didn't want to put the money into trying to to save the the building. Uh, so we've got uh, Gertie Leslie and Toby Belinsky doing um, and have, they had um, they were doing like a, a hot dog roast for the kids on the final day, and uh, some of the, the children on the last day, that was June 26, 1980. And then the school was demolished on October 20th, or 1983, or they started it on October 20th, 1983. Uh, a lot of people found it ironic that uh, the reason that it was given for it being torn down was that the roof was, uh, was uh, in really poor shape. 
but it took them longer than they, ex they planned on to tear it down because the roof wouldn't come down. So, um, but anyway, that was the loss of, of one of the schools. A lot of people were very upset about that. There were big campaigns to try to save the school. Even one of the provincial ministers was really on the side of the, of the locals, but uh, the school board would not, would not change their minds. It, had, it was coming down. Um, so, and then that's now the site where uh, Selkirk Gardens is now, the uh, uh, seniors' uh, condos. So this was Revelstoke's first high school. And it was a little building that had actually been built as an annex to the, the original 1891 school uh, when they were looking, trying to get additional space. And um, it was on a, a little, just a little sliver, a area of land when there was a road called Government Road. That, and you could see it in that, that map photograph that I showed where uh, the, the first school was that there was sort of a diagonal road sort of bisecting that property. Uh, the government road started where uh, Lord Co Auto Parts is now, that little uh, angled section there, that's the last vestige of government road and it angled from there all the way through the uh, school property. And so initially the school only owned uh, on the, the, the north side of that, uh, that angle and eventually they took over the, the entire property. But uh, the little school was built just uh, on the, the corner closest to, corner of that angle uh, closest to Second Street. Uh, so it was just a, a little uh, tiny building with a little, some ornate trim. So kind of a pretty little cottage. And um, so that opened in uh, 1904. And the first uh, teacher was uh, Charles Bruce Sissons who was um, a scholar really from, uh, from Ontario. He was a cousin of Dr. James Woodsworth, who was the general superintendent of missions for the Methodist church and was also founder of the Canadian Commonwealth Federation, which later uh, became the NDP. Uh, Woodsworth had spent a short time at Revelstoke in the uh, local Methodist church, trying to heal a bit of a rift uh, between the, in the congregation at the time. And uh, they asked him if he could recommend a teacher. So he recommended his cousin, C.B. Sissons. Mm -hmm. He was hired at $15 per year. Um, he was uh, uh, very sports minded. He, he did a lot of climbing with A.E. Miller, uh, arranged for a construction of tennis court on the hospital grounds. And in the summer, he worked for A.O. Wheeler during doing the uh, survey of the Selkirk Mountains. And uh, he was one of the early, not the earliest, but one of the, one, an early climber of uh, Mount Begbie and um, wrote an article in the paper saying that uh, there was no reason why everybody in Revelstoke shouldn't uh, be able to climb Mount Begbie. <laughs> and in his first class, he had um, uh, 23 students, three in the second year and all others in the first year. They taught, uh, he taught Latin, Greek, arithmetic, algebra, geometry, English literature, composition and grammar, geography, history, physiology, bookkeeping and drawing. And um, in his first year, Hilda Hobbs won the, the medal at matriculation. That was the sister of Eva Hobbs. And uh, Jeffrey Hagen, one of the students um, uh, became after his uh, time in Revelstoke High School became a Rhodes Scholar and rose to be a Dean of Law at the University of Leeds in England. Um, his father was a local a newspaper editor and um, a metallurgical engineer and quite a few other things as well. Uh, so this school, um, they managed to, they end, eventually hired a second teacher and uh, Sissons moved on to continue his career. Um, and uh, then they built the, uh, the new high school in uh, 1914. And uh, so it opened February 6, 1914. It was built by O.W. Abrahamson, who also built the uh, brick uh, Queen Victoria Hospital where Savon Foods is now. He built uh, Style Trend and quite a few other buildings in town as well. Um, so the newspaper said, for years, high school students and teachers have been hampered 
by the unsanitary and uncomfortable conditions existing in the old ramshackle building in which they have been quartered. Now the energy and perseverance of the school board backed by the city and government have resulted in building in the city the finest high school in BC. And um, in uh, July of 1914, it said the high school had the second highest pass percentage in the province with 83.33 compared to the provincial average of 66.03. Oscar Lundell, who was the brother of Arvid Lundell who ran the Rebel Stick Review for years, had the, uh, uh, the highest average in uh, his class and won a silver medal. And so um, Melville, Melvin Wesley Abbott began teaching at Revelstoke High School in 1924 and later became principal for about 30 years. I've talked quite a bit about Melvin, Mel Abbott, who's a very, very interesting man as well and a mathematician, also an, quite an amazing artist. We have a few of his paintings in our collection. Uh, the uh, An annex was built onto the side of the school. You can just see the side of it here. It was sort of the little pink building that was uh, outside. Uh, and it was built as the home economics and manual training uh, building. So they had a wood shop and metal shop and uh, cooking uh, classes in there. Okay. Okay, I think initially they built it was in home ec was in uh, that edition, but they afterwards after they built the other editions, they probably moved things around. So they built this um, edition in 1951. Uh, previous to that, there was no gymnasium in the building, uh, making school sports difficult. Uh, so they uh, when they were playing outdoor games, they um, had to, they played softball rather than baseball because of the fear of breaking the windows of central school with baseballs. And uh, soccer was difficult, because, or football, because the, the ball would go over the bank into the river. Um, and they weren't, then they didn't have a budget to buy more than one ball a year. The uh, school started a, uh, Melvin Abbott, Mel Abbott started a high school uh, boys outdoor club and um, they eventually built a cabin on uh, the uh, the Jordan Jordan River. Uh, this is uh, some of the, this is Mill Abbott here, and Dorothea Lundell and Peter Grower. I think that's Keith McCoy. And there's uh, Mr. Cox, Peter Grower and Mill Abbott at their, uh, their cabin on the Jordan River around 1948. Uh, the, the first cabin built, burnt down, they built another one, and it was eventually sort of taken away by the, the floods there. Uh, one of the queries that I get quite often is uh, people sending me a picture of a fireplace up the Jordan and saying, what's this fireplace? Oh, that was the fireplace of the in, that came from the, the cabin. And the... Um, High school moved to the uh, to 10th Street in 1964. And at that time, there were two schools at that site. This one, Mountain View Elementary. This was the original Mountain View Elementary, which was built on the south end of the what's now the high school property. And there was also the Joseph Hammond Junior High School, which opened in 1960 on the north end. Uh, that was built after uh, the central school burned down and to accommodate sort of the, you know, those in, the intermediate students. So that was the, the only time that Revelstoke had a junior high school. And it was really only in operation for five, four years. Uh, it was named in honor of Joseph Hammond, who's Helen Hammond's father. He was a longtime uh, uh, school trustee. So they, um, they connected the... Uh, Joseph Hammond High School and the Mountain View Elementary uh, to become the the new the new high school, and they completed that in 1964. And uh, so the first class that graduated from there was in 1965. So that was part of uh, Ken's class. So uh, we graduated in the in the new the new high school. 
Uh, we always enjoyed uh, looking at the pictures in the hallway of all the graduation classes. And it has pictures of the old and the new school. And Kim's picture is, is strategically placed right above the word old. And um, <laughs> his daughter always really enjoyed that. Um, so that was the uh, the secondary school that was rebuilt in 1965. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the uh, the current, uh, those buildings were torn down and uh, the uh, current high school opened in 2011. So uh, what was the, the old high school was transformed into Mountain View Elementary. And uh, in, as of, from 1964 onwards, and uh, it was there until 19, uh, or 2012 when they closed that school. There's a picture of uh, John Mackel with, uh, wasn't sure if that was basketball or volleyball, but uh, yeah. I don't know if anybody recognizes any of those kids, but if you know any names, you can let me know. Some of them look vaguely familiar, but. And um, so Mountain View was uh, closed in uh, 2012 and they removed all of the uh, the added on buildings and uh, left with just the, the 1914 high school. And of course there's a restaurant in there now called the Old School Eatery, which uh, has a lot of photographs of the, the old school in, uh, in, their, in their restaurant. Grade five classroom. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, Farwell School, uh, which was, uh, opened in on February 21st, 1957. And there's a picture of the opening ceremonies. And the man on the stage there is Sam Needham Sr. And he's uh, holding that picture that I showed of the first school class uh, that he was in. Uh, so sort of, you know, coming full circle in, uh, in, in uh, finally had a school back in that neighborhood. Um, so I'm not sure right off the top of my head what year that school closed, but of course it's now Okanagan College and uh, um, I can't remember the name of the, the, the child care, Stepping Stones Child Care Center. Uh, Big, Ellie, Big Eddie Elementary opened in 1959 and uh, closed in 2002 and uh, it's been since torn down. Uh, there's a picture of Mark Stovall, who taught there for years with uh, student Aaron Barasoff at their grade seven graduation in 1991. And uh, the Mount Begbie School, that was supposed to be the talk that we had today, but I'll just give you, you show you a three of the probably 80 or so pictures that you're going to get to see. Uh, so this was in the, the newspaper. Uh, in April of 1967, when they had awarded the contract uh, for the school. So that was a, an architect's design of what it was going to look like. Uh, and there's a picture from Rosemary of the actual construction of the school. And I was, we didn't have any pictures of that. So I was happy to see that, you see this one. And then the school completed in 1970. They eventually uh, built on a, a full gymnasium and additional classrooms a little later on. And uh, then it was um, uh, closed in 2012 and then since, uh, since torn down. Uh, Rosemary actually has quite a few photographs of the, the demolition as well. So you'll be able to see those eventually. Uh, Columbia Park Elementary opened on Colbeck Road in Columbia Park in November of 1975. That was, of course, Revelstoke was experiencing a, a boom then during the construction of the Revelstoke Dam. So there are a lot of families that are were moving into town and a lot of uh, new homes going up. And uh, so uh, Columbia Park was built to uh, accommodate that population. And then Arrow Heights opened in September 1979. Again, that era, area was really starting to grow. Um, and then Begbie View School opened in 2012. Just going to quickly talk about some of the rural schools as well, because uh, before there was any kind of busing, there there was a need really for schools in the outlying areas so that you know children were able to access uh, the schools closer to, to where they lived. So this was 
long before the Big Ele Eddie Elementary. This was just a little Big Eddie schoolhouse. Uh, this, unfortunately, this photograph is in rather rough condition. Uh, but uh, Ed, Edna Bruce, uh, later Edna Carpenter, was the school teacher there. And she doesn't look a heck of a lot older than some of the children in the class. And most of these were one, maybe at the most two room schoolhouses. And um, this is, they had a little school at Mount McPherson, a little bit further south from Big Eddie. And uh, it's Wilfred Clough painting the school. And uh, there was a schoolhouse at Glacier. Uh, for quite a few years, uh, Mary McKinnon was the, uh, or later Mary Thompson was the school teacher there. We have quite a few pictures of her with her class. And uh, they, there was a school at Beaton. It was the original small school, and then they replaced it with this new one in 1948. And uh, when they were preparing to flood the area with the dam, they moved that school from Beaton to Trout Lake, and that's now the Trout Lake Community Hall. And we have some rather harrowing pictures showing it being moved on that road, you know, and for like um, almost half of the building hanging over the edge of the, the edge of the cliff as they're as they're driving it down the road. Um, so that building still exists. Uh, Arrowhead uh, Community had a school. It was uh, built in the early 1900s, and uh, after the it was above the high water mark, so the building remained there. And after the community of Arrowhead was was moved, completely moved out of of there, uh, the um, I think it was the Alliance Church bought it and they operated it as Camp Arrow, Arrowhead for quite a few years until it was uh, the building was eventually burned. And uh, a little at Hall's Landing, I think there's an amazing photograph. Um, really rustic school. They did have a, they did build a new, another school later, but that was the original Halls Landing School in 1811. And the Halls, the Halls Landing and Sidmouth were quite close together. The 12 mile school in the 1940s, uh, Ken's grandmother, Irene English, taught uh, at the Mount Carchet School and at the 12 mile school. And she was, would have been in her late 50s, early 60s at the time. She was kind of called out of retirement because they were short of, of teachers, especially for some of the rural schools. So she would ride her bike from Revelstoke down to school, up down to 12 mile and then stay there you know, for and then come back, ride her bike back on the weekends into town. And then they built a newer school at 12 mile in 1957. So I wanted to end with uh, one little story, which is probably one of my favorite kind of education adjacent stories. Ivor Bassett was the uh, principal in uh, for both the Selkirk and Central schools in the early 1920s. And I read some the, the uh, school board minutes and they would call him out on things fairly often. And he was extremely arrogant, would sort of push back and you know, say, how dare you question my authority? And uh, at one point he was called in because he was, uh, they were concerned that he hadn't, was having an inappropriate relationship with Miss Kane. And uh, he denied it up and down, uh, even though Miss Kane was pregnant with his child at the time and uh, said, uh, she's a friend of my wife's and she comes to our house to visit my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, but then not long after that, uh, that interjection by the board, um, he left town and he stole $132 from the school bank account, which the kids' children had raised to buy a new projector for the school. Uh, so uh, he was he was pretty pretty bad man in terms of you know not being not doing what a principal should have been doing. And uh, this was probably my favorite uh, uh, headline of all times from the Revelstoke Review, June first, nineteen twenty two. Ivor Bassett is nabbed in Frisco. So they uh, found him in San Francisco and uh, said Miss Kane also hold, held for violating immigration laws and is deported. She was given to her father for um, into his hands. Uh, but uh, so Ivor Bassett did go to jail. After he was released, he uh, his wife divorced him and he went to Oregon and uh, met up with, with Miss Kane uh, where she already had his child. They had another child and then he left her and he ended up 
dead on a park bench in Florida at the age of you know, early 50s. Uh, but for a while, he was actually working as a, a classical radio uh, or classical music uh, commenter, commentator on the radio station out of Vancouver. And uh, one of his co-workers said that um, he was nothing to look at, but said he had this, he was from Wales, and he had this beautiful sing-songy Welsh voice. And it said it drove the ladies mad. <laughs> so it was his voice that, that got, the, got the women. And apparently he was very knowledgeable of classical music. He was uh, hosting this radio show for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he, yeah, he's, he's kind of my favorite uh, local school teacher character. <laughs> um, and there's a lot, I mean, lots of other stories too. Uh, we have an interview with Mel Abbott and he talks about some, the uh, way that interactions with the school board and the school board was very confrontational with the teachers for a long time. And in the, you know, 40s or so, the, the school teachers would, um, they had all had individual contracts with the school board and they all had to negotiate their salary individually. And then finally they agreed to have one teacher to negotiate the salaries on behalf of, of all of the other teachers. And Mel Abbott said that he was given that position quite often, but it meant that he, was, he would manage to get an increase for everybody else but then they wouldn't give him an increase as payback for him negotiating increases for everybody else. Um, so he said it was pretty confrontational for a long time. And he said that changed when uh, James Cameron came to Revelstoke as the, uh, uh, I think he was the secretary treasurer of the school board and said things changed drastically then uh, for the better. Um, and the teachers and the school board worked together. But uh, Mel Abbott talked about one case where uh, a woman school teacher had uh, was going to meet the school board, and they were going to meet in the upper room in the um, the high school building. And uh, they had her waiting outside the door, and she was waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And finally, she got pretty quiet in there, and she opened the door, and it was empty. They'd all gone down the fire escape because they didn't want to talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll leave the talk at that. Um, just uh, let everybody know that we're doing an, having an exhibit opening next Thursday, November 7th, uh, here at two o'clock to open our uh, exhibit, Reclaimed Voices. And it'll be in this room. So you can see some sort of uh, panels uh, sitting along the side there. Those are all gonna be up on the wall by next week and uh, some exhibit cases and um, we're quite excited about this. It's telling some stories that we haven't really told in the past. The one wall over there is for women's voices. So some interesting stories about women's perspectives. There's a, a story of Adeline, who was the uh, wife of the man referred to as Cultus Jim, and it's an ex man who was murdered in 1894. She lived into her, into her hundreds and has living relatives. So we've, uh, got information, uh, Laura Stovall prepared that uh, panel. Uh, we've got uh, panels about the uh, Japanese Canadian community in Revelstoke, and then another panel uh, about uh, children's lives in Revelstoke. So uh, we're quite excited about opening this one and uh, encourage you to come. Um, there will be chocolate cake made by Jose of Moon Dilly Treats, and that's always a good reason to attend uh, an exhibit opening. Actually, I say we only, I only do exhibit so we can get a cake, but done by Jose. Uh, so I encourage you to come to that if you're able to. And then the next Brown Bag History will be on Wednesday, November 13th, uh, Revelstoke during World War One. So thank you for coming today. Thank you.